So this is fairly typical of the sort of thing we come across quite a lot. When it comes to central heating wiring, there's a lot of electricians just don't want to know. It's too fiddly, there's too much going on. It's just not for them. So if you've got something like a boiler breakdown, it was tripping the RCD downstairs. So every time they switched the boiler on, the heating on, the whole lot went out. I came along because they basically couldn't get anyone else to do it. Sometimes a plumber will come along and go, oh no, you need an electrician. If you call an electrician, sometimes they come along and say, oh, you need a heating guy. You're stuck between a rock and a hard place. So I pulled it all out because I couldn't work with it all inside the box. So I've pulled the connector blocks out a bit, give me a chance to get my tester on. I've got quite a nice 17th edition tester, which is perfectly good. So what you've got to do basically is isolate each circuit one by one and work through them and find the fault. Apart from the fact there's four different zones on this, it, it wouldn't be too bad. If it was just a standard two zone going into a standard wiring center, you'd be all right. But the trouble with wiring centers is they're not big enough. They do not have enough ways for something where you've got underfloor heating, you've got a few other things going on, you very soon use up all those connectors. Having a bigger box like this is great, but of course you don't get the numbers telling you where each wire goes. So it's a bit of investigation to do. I wasn't gonna do it that night. I went around in the evening to sort it out. So what I did is this. So I just put the whole lot onto a timer and took the boiler controls and plugged them in to this plug and socket arrangement here, which meant that they could have the boiler on, they could run all the heating. I opened the motorized valves manually so that at least they were getting flow through all the different circuits. The only trouble with that is there wasn't any temperature control. So the next thing I did was to turn down the thermostat on the boiler for the central heating. That meant that they would be able to control the temperature through the radio, this it wouldn't overheat, so that was fine. Even though I've bypassed all the room thermostats it's not going to get too hot so that just left me with the circuits now i got lucky here because the very first circuit which was basically the last one on the board so i was working backwards we got here a motorized valve so this is the one for the underfloor heating for the kitchen now i'm going to try and show you what's going on it's very tight in here can't get the camera in at the right angle but let me just show you what i found so this is the motorized valve that i traced the fault to and I've taken the head off, which is only basically two screws, so you can remove the head fairly easily. And then it gave me a chance to poke about. In the bottom of this motorized valve is a micro switch. What I discovered was this bit of insulation here. This is just a bit of paper, some kind of cardboard affair. Now you can see that those cables, there's a solder connection on that one. And it was sitting on the bottom. There's a big blob of solder there, and it was actually touching this little bit of cardboard here. If that cardboard is bone dry, there's no problem. It would not short through, but as soon as you get a tiny bit of moisture, just above it is a pump gland and those drip, so it's dry now, but who knows what was happening there. Maybe a little drop of moisture got into that motorized valve and that was enough to wet this crude bit of insulation that they put there and cause the thing to trip out. So no need to change the actual wire in there. I've only just noticed there's actually three terminals on this switch, so I don't know what that third one does. So in here is a little switch. So that will allow you to test it and see whether that little micro switch is actually switching on and off. And it all appears to be fine. I'm just gonna cut a little bit of plastic and pop it under there. So if I put it back in the right position and put the screw over, it should all work. That screw's supposed to go in the back in that little hole there, so you have to line that up fairly well. So that screw's right in the right position now. That little cover is over the contacts, and the contacts are actually touching the metal work. So if we can bend that up slightly, I'll just slide a bit of plastic in there, and hopefully that should do the job. I could actually replace the whole head, but it's quite expensive to do. So what I've done there, I've just put that little bit of plastic slipped it under there, done the screw up again. So that goes in, that's like doubling up on what's there. There's a crappy bit of cardboard that's in there. And now I've just doubled it up with that. So now I can just pop that back on the body. If you're doing that, sometimes you've got to just open it manually, get it lined up, that's it. Now it's lined up, two screws. And then we pop the cover back on. And I don't like these covers, because the screw, it's all right in this case, but sometimes you find that the screw is underneath and you can't get to it. So you end up using a pair of pliers to undo the screw. 
just get my little bit of plastic to pop inside that cover for good order. There you are, it's on now. So I'm back home now and I've dug out an old motorized valve. Hopefully from this, you can get a better idea of what I was talking about. This micro switch here is intended to come on when the motorized valve opens and once the valve is open, it switches a relay in there, if you like, micro switch in there, to turn on the boiler and in this case, the pump as well. So what we've got there is a little micro switch. That's operated by the valve mechanism opening. The only thing that is stopping that cable from shorting out on this metal body, which is obviously earth, is this bit of cardboard here. That piece of cardboard, to me, is woefully inadequate. And that's where I'm gonna slide a little bit of plastic in there just to give it a second line of defense. Once that screw goes back, those terminals are sitting right on the bottom. So they're very close to the metal body. Pretty poor design. So I just thought I'd have a look at a new one. What they've done, I've never really noticed this before because I haven't actually had to service any new ones, but they've put a very substantial plastic body round here and that houses the micro switch beautifully. So that gives it a good bit of insulation along there. That plastic body is separating that perfectly from there. The terminal is now soldered in there very neatly. And all you've got to do to take that micro switch out is flick that back and lift it out. That's a great thing. I'm not going to do it. And the reason I'm not going to do it is because this is a brand new unit and I don't want to mess it up if I'm going to be selling it to a customer or anything. I don't want to start dismantling it. But again, we've got a little test switch at the back here, which we can test. If that's working, that would be the orange and the gray wire. So if you put a continuity tester across between the orange and the gray, you'll get continuity when that switch is switching. And when it's not switching, obviously it, the continuity will go out. So that's a great way of testing it. Obviously all this has to be done with the electricity off. Now I'm not a Part P registered electrician and as I understand the regs, I don't need to be to work on existing circuits and just replace a component like that. So I'm quite happy to do it. I'm quite happy to do all the tests afterwards. If electricians actually got themselves up to speed with all the stuff, we wouldn't need to bother because we could just call electricians out and they'd do it. I know lots of plumbers who just leave the wires dangling when they install a system and say, oh, you'll have to get an electrician to wire that up. And a lot of the time they've got a pet electrician who knows how to do it. But it is actually wiring by numbers. So in that case, you don't, fault finding's a bit harder, but you don't really need to understand what you're doing if you've got two zone valves in the system and you've got a little terminal strip, a little wiring center like that, you've got the programmer going in there, you've got the boiler, you've got the pump and your cylinder and your rim stat, it's a fairly easy system to work. This is what we call an S plan, which is basically, I don't know why it's called S, but it's got two valves on it, two zone valves, and it's a standard one. So one of those would be going to the hot water cylinder and the other one would be going to the heating. So not too hard until you start getting four zones and you start getting a fault. Then it's, it can be a long day. Anyway, I'm Roger Bisbee. I hope you found that useful. Come back and see us soon. I reckon we ought to do more on central heating wiring because as I said, there's a huge black hole out there. A lot of people don't understand it. A lot of electricians might want a little bit. There are one or two good guys around who are doing good videos on YouTube on central heating wiring, but there's no reason why we shouldn't add to the knowledge base, if you like, by making our own. Thanks very much for watching. Come back and see us soon.